Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam Asher Kidshanu Bamitzvotav Vitzivanu Lachzok Dikre Torah. Thank you, source of all, for the inspiration to delve deeply into learning into Torah. Amen. Okay, so I'm going to, um, Rabbi Julie, I'm going to mute everybody and you can unmute yourself. Okay, great. Thank you to Bobby Cohen for our Zoom tech support today and to everybody for being here. We, in our last session, looked at the way the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College had a radical approach to Jewish education based on the Reconstructing Jewish concept of evolving civilizations, that Judaism is actually an evolving civilization. It's different in different historic periods. And so the curriculum at RRC, the Rabbinical College, was organized for many years by civilizational focus, biblical, rabbinic, modern, um, biblical, rabbinic, medieval, modern, and contemporary, five different civilizations, setting the foundation for us to go forth with the understanding that we needed to co-create the next civilization, drawing on the past, creating the future. I will tell you in our third session that, that the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College no longer organizes its curriculum that way. It had a complete curriculum overhaul, but this was a really radical and amazing um, way to organize the teaching for many, many years, a real contribution to how to think about Judaism. And so in our first session, we looked at the biblical period and we looked at how in the biblical period, there was not the concept of an of really of individuals at all. Uh, people were part of a collective community and there was not the concept of an individual soul that was earning merit or demerit. And yet there was the concept of some kind of life after death in a very concrete way. Like, you know, where did thinking about like a physical arena where maybe bodies hang out just under the earth and thinking about physical revival of putting the bones and the blood and the body back together. And we, some of the stories that are actually in the Torah, we have Jacob saying, I am about to be gathered to my kin. Kind of as he was dying, I am about to be gathered to my kin very biblical understanding. And we may circle back to ancient times when we go into the future of today and how we see um, afterlife. A lot of the, a very long story in the Bible is about the, um, you know, the, the death of some of these founding fathers and where they're buried and the purchase of the first piece of land ever owned by the Jewish community, which was the cave of Machpelah which is where some of our ancestors were buried. I think you can still go visit it today in Bethlehem or somewhere there. I do believe you can visit it. And then we also talked about how in the time, you know, as, as history progressed, there's the Babylonian exile, very challenging to our people and challenges always create new opportunities. And this was a new opportunity for us to start thinking about new forms of experiencing and expressing Judaism. And then also the Maccabean rebellion where a lot of individuals did dramatic brave things and it just didn't seem right for them to be slaughtered at young ages and not have an afterlife. So we start seeing events in the world in history pushing our kind of theology and our intellectual concepts towards new ideas. I think about that today because even in today's world, crises are also opportunities for new things. And so as we face our various crises today, what new pathways for thinking and organizing things will come forward in our own lives? And we're looking at how that happened in history. So some of these really devastating historical events like the Babylonian exile or like the Maccabean struggle 
actually led to creative new ways of thinking about life after death. And we come up with the idea at that time for the first time of Jeremiah, for instance, is saying everyone shall die for his own sins. So suddenly you hear a linking of an individual life being evaluated for their good deeds or bad deeds and rewarded or punished based on their individual situation. But you still kind of see the concept of it's really related to your merit in a certain way. It's a pun, like to die is a punishment, in other words. Death is a punishment. And we also see how in very late biblical times, the concept of resurrection, of an afterlife, or you know, some kind of a renewal at the end of time, that's a little bit different than just an afterlife, uh, comes to be and that they're calling it Olam Haba. And when they think about Olam Haba, the world to come, they're thinking about a kind of utopian, messianic, like a lot of social justice and material prosperity um, time. And like I said, there's the, the afterlife, maybe is just more connected to right after your life. But then there's also this kind of apocalyptic end of days idea that maybe after everything's over and done with, there will be a renewal called the end of days that um, is kind of like a resurrection there. Now, as we move from one civilization into the next, if those of you who did the reading know that this was not like a cut and dried, okay, here's the bucket of biblical time, and then there's a cutoff, and here's the bucket of rabbinic time, a cutoff, then comes medieval. It's much more fluid than that. So there's a lot of kind of co-evolving of things that kind of start and they evolve and they're coexisting for some period of time. There's no precise demarcation, but we do start seeing in the rabbinic period this concept of a soul that is separate from the body. And it's not that there weren't also the ideas of resurrecting the actual bones of bodies, but there begins to coexist the idea of a soul. They're still very concrete thinkers in the rabbinic period, really concrete thinkers. So they're very interested in the moment of death. Now, what happens at that moment of death that's a transition from body to soul? What actually is happening? And they imagined 903 different kinds of death and made a big list because it would happen differently, whether you were gasping for air or bleeding to death, and they charted it all out. And they also came up with, probably you've heard of the Malavimavit, the angel of death, that was a rabbinic concept of the angel of death who descends at that time of death and is kind of escorting you into this world to come. And they asked a lot of very concrete questions. Like if, if what would you want to know if you thought that life after death was somewhat physical in some way and you're kind of groping towards a, you know, more of a spiritual sense of a soul. If you, but if you really thought there's gonna be like a renewal of life after death, what kind of questions might you wanna know if you were a biblical or early rabbinic thinker about these things, what would you be curious about? You're a very concrete thinker. I can tell you some of the things they were curious about, but let me see what you'd be curious about if you were back there then and you, you know, didn't have your abstract thinking abilities because you're from a more you know, developed civilization in some ways. Uh, Ruth, you can unmute. Sorry. Yeah. Wait, you're still on mute, Ruth. It's there you go. Wor- it's not no, that's working. good. We can hear you. Okay, now. You're good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I would think that they would think about like, what age would I be when I'm like, yeah, like after after I die, where am I going to be? Am I going to be somewhere where I'm going to meet relatives? Am I going to be what age am I going to be after I die? Um, 
Yeah. Am I going to, you know, if they look at practical things, you know, that kind of thing. Right. And how am I going to feed myself? Is it going to, yeah. um, am I going to meet God up there? Is he going to meet me at the pearly gate? Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and Pat, let's have another one from Pat. What can I take with me? What should I take? Do, yeah. I, do I need to bring my pots and pans? <laughs> Absolutely. And you can see yes. that in many civilizations, people were asking those questions and actually burying things with people. And there's, I, I read about this. I didn't know it before. Apparently, there's a Jewish tradition to actually bury a stick in the coffin. Did anybody ever hear of that? To bury a stick so that you could kind of whack away the demons or kind of do whatever you needed to do. You'd have a tool. So um, who knew? But yeah, like if you think about Egyptian burial practices, and this, so they were asking things like, do the dead feel pain? Are they aware of the living? Because we know the living are certainly aware of the people they're remembering, but are the dead aware of us here on earth? So yeah, they were asking all those kinds of things. And into the rabbinic period, they started imagining Gehenna, which is actually a place of punishment, not just a nether world like Sheol, which was the biblical period, but Gehenna was more like a place where you're going to get your just treatment, you know, of punishment for things that you didn't do right on earth, ethical transgressions, and this was used to encourage righteous behavior. So you start seeing this more ethical connection, not just that all dead people go hang out in Sheol and it's sort of somewhere under the earth, but that there's an ethical component to it. And um, still kind of thinking of it as a physical place in some way. And also they imagined the Garden of Eden being the opposite of Gehenna in a way, like somehow the Garden of Eden was a place that people who did well on earth would be lodged. As the rabbinic period carries on, we get the beautiful concept that I love as we develop the concept of souls separate from this bodily journey. We get the concept of a storehouse of souls where every soul that's yet to be born starts out in this treasury of, of souls and then is drawn down to a body in earth. I think that's beautiful. And then, you know, lives a life on earth. In Friday night services, I was sharing with you the Teilhard de Chardin quote that says, we are not human beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. And this concept of the treasury of souls really speaks to that, that we start out as these spiritual beings, whatever that means. And we have a short you know, time, a fleeting turn in a body on this earth. Hopefully we do well with it. We make some contributions to the earth. We do some mitzvahs. And then we're back into the eternity of the soul. So that starts to develop as a rabbinic concept. And then when we get to the medieval period, kind of 600s on for, you know, maybe six to 800 years, maybe even more different places, different coexisting historical eras. But in the medieval area, we get a much more mystical understanding of this journey of the soul, like with kind of all the different layers of heaven and it's very detailed visions and the journeying and the chariot and all of this. And it's, it's sort of really kind of ecstatic and mysterious and very visual fantasies of what it would be like to go on this journey of the soul. And that's kind of the way the medieval mystics take these same teachings. But, and here we're gonna get to our work for today. After the medieval period, we start hitting modernity at different times and in different places. And I know many people here have studied a little bit about this transition. I know Ed was speaking to it at Berkowitz last time, and we've done some studying at Leif Ha'ir over the years about this huge juncture. But modernity really changed everything. All of a sudden, you start having the beginnings of scientific and, and mechanical technical understandings. People actually started saying, well, if there's a soul, 
and it's separate from the body, we should be able to measure the weight of the soul. So when the body's dead, how does the weight of the body change as the soul leaves and continues on its journey? And we start seeing scientific explorations of these theological concepts. Also, as we get into the 1800s, and especially into the 1900s, the 19th and 20th centuries, the world becomes a lot smaller. Trade routes are larger. We encounter more people of different cultures. And we start to see that every culture has its own ideas about the afterlife, its own specific burial processes, and its own ideas about reward and punishment for ethical behavior. And so it makes us reflect back on our own Jewish understandings of those things. In a way, it liberates these practices in a certain way, because we see, oh, you know what, this is our way of doing it, but there's many ways of doing it. And how do we want to look at this? And of course, we're in a much, much more um, individualistic society where people don't necessarily take the teaching from their religious community. They figure it out on their own life journey of kind of encountering questions and understanding as probably each one of us here mostly did. Like we weren't mostly living into a specific Jewish, unless you're raised in a very intensely Orthodox community, ultra Orthodox probably, you're exposed more to the world and to the diversity and you make your choices about how you're gonna see it and what you're gonna do about it. So let me stop there and see if people have questions or comments because that was a lot that I just laid out there. And of course, the upshot of all this modernity was people starting to really question, um, you know, what is going on here? Like, what, what can we really think about this concept of Olam Haba, the world to come? We no longer believe it's a physical place. We no longer actually believe it's just related to being rewarded or punished for something you did in your individual life. So what, what are we gonna do with this? Where are we gonna go with it? And it opens up a lot of questions. And I see Debbie S is saying a poem by Wordsworth called Ode, Intimations of Immortality. Do you wanna say more about that, Debbie? Yeah, so this is a poem I've always loved. And what you said about um that we're spiritual beings having a human experience brought this to mind right away, especially this part where it says, our birth is but a sleep and a forgetting. The soul that rises with us, our life star, hath had elsewhere its setting and cometh from afar. Um, you know, I don't want to read the whole poem. It's easy enough to find. But, um, you know, this idea, where, where are we before we become a human being? Were we anywhere? You know, the yeah. ancient, our biblical ancestors, I don't think we're talking about that in particular, but I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Yeah. Who else? Carol? I was not raised in the Orthodox tradition, but my daughter in modernity has embraced it and in their tradition the soul leaves the body upon death and cremation is anathema and that is a problem for me and my husband my mother my father were all cremated i have prepaid for cremation and the thought of causing pain to my daughter is painful so it's a it's a current dilemma for me but it's interesting that it comes out at this particular moment. It seems so clear. Yeah, thank you for raising that because the way you think about these things does affect you know, what you choose to do and your family relationships. And it's, if people think differently in the same family, it can be cause for you know, tension. So thank you for that, Carol, yes. The way we think about these things matters. It impacts our lives. Does somebody else wanna to speak to any of that? Um, Ada, you, need, you can unmute. 
I've been smiling all along because I am going to have quite a discussion with my dear friend when we talk about the afterworld because two different approaches, two different cultures, and I anticipate a wonderful debate. Interesting. Yeah, because I mean, the main focus of Judaism actually through all these ages has been on this world. It's being mm -hmm. right. It's been on part you know, being God's partner in the creation of a better world here, and so it's certainly in modern times when we think about what is what do messianic times mean, we're not thinking about a Messiah who's going to land on Earth and fix everything. We're thinking about how do we work together and make better times, and we sort of think of, um, you know, kind of. What we, th we think about like sort of renewal of the dead happening in a way that kind of carries on the best the best aspirations of those who have come before by the work we do here today to make a good world. Yeah. Anybody else now? Okay. Oh, Susan. Are you unmuted, Susan? I want to ask a question about uh, cremation. Was it, um, is it mostly only in the Orthodox world that that is um, uh, something that is not uh, thought about in a good way, or is it in the whole Jewish tradition? I, I'm confused because yeah. I listen to Carol and I know more and more Jewish people that are um, being cremated. And yeah. um, I've been, I have been confused by it. Yeah, that's a really good question. A lot of people talk to me about that exact issue coming to me as a rabbi, you know, because it concerns people. Well, you know, cremation never was a Jewish practice. Like in some cultures, you know, like in, I think in Hinduism, I believe you burn the body on a pyre and that's the practice. That was never a practice in Judaism. Uh, but especially once the Holocaust, in, you know, kind of gave us the images of bodies going into ovens and becoming ashes is just terrible, terrible history and memories. At that point, cremation, even the more so, wasn't a Jewish practice. But the fact is that in the modern world, you know, we're taking into account many different things. Land is at a premium. Um, land can be used for growing food and for other things that are also good for humanity. And, um, you know, as we move farther away from that specific horrible tragedy, we kind of come into the, the bigger modern sense of choice. Like you get to choose, what do you want to do? And um, how do you, you know, making your own choices about but that. Yeah, I've been noticing a big change. So I will say it's, it's not a Jewish practice, but many Jewish people do it. And if you're a reconstructing Jewish person, you then say, well, Judaism is about what the Jews do. Right. So how can you say it's not a Jewish practice? Traditionally, it wasn't really a Jewish practice, but as many, many more Jews are doing it, right. um, it actually kind of is a Jewish practice these days, you have to say, by looking at the facts on the ground, which is that Jews are doing it. And that's kind of a reconstructing Judaism approach to defining what is Judaism. Okay, Rabbi. Oh, yes. Enid. Enid, yes, your turn. You're next. Yeah. Um, yeah, this whole, I'm glad Carol brought up the cremation thing. Uh, if we're supposed to go dust back to dust yes. and disintegrate naturally. Uh, I, I don't understand the cremation thing. And I, I will say this, since, well, I saw the Hindu practice, by the way, when I was in Nepal, and that was cool. very personal, very beautifully done. That's different. That's not putting somebody into an oven. And from my own personal point of view, since the Second World War, I find the thought, the impersonal, I, I couldn't even do it to my cat, um, to put somebody in, into an oven, very, very cold. And I, I, I'm not quite sure, even though people are doing it, how in Jewish tradition, 
we 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 can look at it or or some some thinking about it because it, it's something that's really bothered me. So I, I just wanted to put and Carol and I have discussed this many times. So yeah, that, that's yeah. And so when we were asking the question about you know continuity as times change, I mean, is there a way you would under you could understand that as another version of dust to dust, for instance, so that it spoke to the tradition? It doesn't have to be exactly the same practice, but people have very strong feelings about this in many ways. Some people don't want to be in the ground with worms eating you. you know, people have very strong feelings in many different ways, and you have to choose something as you make your end of life decision. So how can you think about it in a Jewish way as you work your way through it? Certainly what your family members want, what your ancestors did are all relevant. That's Jewish, right? We're about the generation, so that matters. So yeah, I think these are important questions. And a lot of people talk to me about these exact questions. Let, let's have one more comment or question here and we're gonna move on. And I think I see Maria. Um, personally, I find cremation because of the Holocaust to me, that's just, I'd rather be part of the soil and the earth. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, you're yeah. good. Okay. I would rather be part of, you know, the soil and the earth, but I also remember the laws of physics. And one of the laws of physics is matter can neither be if I remember this right, can that matter can be neither destroyed nor created, but it can be changed into a different form of energy. So for those who have cremation, I think, okay, they're now being, they're not, it's not being destroyed. They're just becoming a part of a different form of energy. And that, 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 that's how I make my peace with it. Thank you, Maria. Okay, so in the medieval period, we, we all know Maimonides, one of our great uh, philosopher sages who had his 13 attributes. And guess what the 13th of them is? It's about committing to believing in the resurrection of the dead, Tehiyat HaMetim. In modern times, that's pretty challenging to a lot of people. Now, luckily in Judaism, we don't actually have like a catechism where you actually have to believe certain things. So he was suggesting these as the 13 principles of Judaism, but you're not like kicked out if you don't believe in them. But the 13th of those 13 principles, which you guys chant, uh, certainly every High Holy Days, when we do the prayer that goes, Adonai, Adonai, El Rachum Vechanun, Erech Apayim. I see some people singing along here. So that's a very familiar chant. These, those are the 13 attributes that Maimonides offered. And the last of them is um, believing in the resurrection of the dead. And in an absolutely central prayer of Judaism, the Amidah, the standing silent prayer that's part of every Jewish prayer service every day of the week. The second blessing in that, the one that goes, Atagi Borle Olam Adonai, Rav Lehoshia, Mechalkel Chaim Bechesed. At the end of that prayer, I'm going to screen share and show you exactly what it says. And we're going to wrestle with it a little bit. Okay, can everybody see the screen here? I think if you need it to be bigger, you can do that on your own device up at the top of your screen. You can make it bigger or smaller. So this is the second prayer of the Amidah of the 18 benedictions that's part of all these. And here we go, you sustain life through love, giving life to all. And we've got reviving the dead right here. Let me go. Let me go um, here. Here's the beginning of it. Atagi borle olam Adonai mechaykei hakol rav lohoshia. Now, in progressive Jewish traditions, a lot of the denominations take out this part that says you revive the dead, and instead they say you give life to all, which is kind of. Um, you 
instead it's mechaye hakol, as you give life to all, is a modern uh, insertion instead of saying you resurrect the dead. And then as we get down to the end, you're all very familiar with this. Mechakel chayim b'chesed, mechayeh hakol b'rachamim rabim. Again, you can see in the parentheses here, some of the denominations take out resurrecting the dead, which would be mechayeh metim, mechayeh ha-metim, resurrecting the dead. And instead put, you give life to all. So what we're going to do here is we're gonna take a minute to see if anyone has any questions just about how this prayer comes down to us. With these choices now, one from the tradition, which is about resurrecting the dead, and one a modern kind of upgrading, which is to say God renews everything, but takes out the resurrection of the dead. Let's just see, I'm gonna stop the share here now so we can see each other again. Um, anybody have thoughts about that? And then we're actually going to go into breakout rooms and discuss what would you do if you were a contemporary person like you are, and you inherited a prayer that said in Hebrew, God resurrects the dead. What would that mean to you? And would you want to keep that same ancient language in or would you want to change it up? If so, how would you want to change it up? How would you wrestle with that? And the people creating our prayer books did wrestle with that and make their choices. So in a minute, we're going to be in breakout rooms, small group discussions of four people. And uh, those will be your questions. Is how would you deal with a tradition that gives you that language about resurrecting the dead? But let's just see if anybody has any questions or comments before we go into the breakout rooms. Does anybody need to see the screen share again? Because you, you won't have this in your breakout room, I don't believe, once you're in the breakout rooms. Do you want to see it one more time? Okay, let me go back to it. I just I wanted to say something, Rabbi Julie. Yeah, please. It seems like because if, if the scholars and the sages were looking at that word, revive the dead, I think you could almost interpret it as keep their memory alive because once they're dead, you have to find a different way of connecting okay. to them. So I would almost think, and this is what I hear, and I just saw it before maybe from Carol, is that we hold on to those dead people through the wonderful things they did or how they were in our lives. We name our children after them. We, we do a lot of things that revive them in a metaphorical way. So I just think you could, take that line and allow it if you could see it as, um, you know, there are many ways I, I keep my grandmother alive by her recipes or, uh, you know, how she uh, kept her home or things like that. And, and I think that is something I love about Judaism because I hear that so often that people don't forget the past and they share it. Okay, so that's exactly what you're going to do in your small groups. Your group of about four people needs to agree on what you're going to do with this prayer and how you're going to explain it. How are you reconstructing this prayer from the past so that it reflects both our tradition and our understanding of life today and maybe life after life? So that's exactly what we're going to do, Paul. So save that for your small group, but hopefully each small group is going to have one plan they put forth when we come back in to check in about this. Are there any other questions or comments now about that? And let me just add one more thing. When your small group comes up with what you want to do with this prayer, you have to explain it in terms that will make sense in terms of Jewish tradition. It can't just be something completely pulled out of thin air. It has to be connected to the civilizations that came before within Judaism. Enid? Um, yeah, I, I, I have a question. We talk about resurrecting the dead. Did that come before Christianity? In other well, words, because they believe in resurrection, is is this something that the rap that was picked up, or is that something that already was there? That's a really good question. So Christianity started out as a sect within Judaism, as you know, and at that right. time there were discussions within Judaism 
one of those discussions became the Christians, but there were people who had different ideas about this back then, yes. So it was very kind of fermenting around that time, yes. Okay, we're gonna go into our breakout rooms, make sure someone's taking notes or gonna be your report back person, and we're gonna hear what you wanna do to reconstruct this particular prayer in a way that has both continuity and change meaningfulness for today. Bobby's gonna launch us into the breakout rooms. Okay, I think everyone who wanted to be in a room is in a room. A couple people did not go. Okay, I'm telling people and, that. And it didn't come up for me how to set the time. So it's oh, 15, okay. not 10. I don't. Oh, well, you could just end them after 10. Okay. Yeah, let's see what you mean. Breakout rooms in progress. Um, it looks like they have 12 minutes, but if you end them at nine, they give you an extra minute, you know, at the yeah, end. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay. But what's nine minutes from now? It's going to be. Can I do the math there? Let's see. It's like well, six, it was 15 six, minutes, minutes started. So when it's like five minutes remaining. It's like 1256, I think, will be nine minutes. And then they'll give everybody oh, an extra minute. Yeah. If you close the rooms, then it'll give people an extra minute and we'll come back and report back. Okay. And it looks like Yvette's not in a group. And I think it's hard to know to push the button. So some people don't. And for yeah, and I don't, I don't know where the buttons pop up on a phone, so. Who's on the phone? Is, is Ellen on a phone? Ellen's on a phone, I think, or a, or a tablet. Okay, well, and Joanne somehow has a way of, right? Joanne, um, I don't know how she does that. Joanne. I saw her pop Joanne did join, yeah, Joanne. Yeah, I saw her join, but how does she join the breakout room? Do we have to push something? Well, she could be on her computer and which talks to her so i don't i don't know tell her to do it yeah but bobby i guess you're you can't be in a breakout room because you're the host yeah it didn't, it didn't want to make me the host i'll main i'll staff the main room here and you can go be in a breakout room no it's fine get to be part of the conversation i'm good okay let them start with what they're doing i don't want to interrupt it <clears throat> Unless Ellen, you would like to talk and we can be our own breakout room. And Yvette, my New York contingency. Oh, you're on mute, Ellen, but you can unmute yourself. Well, Yvette's here, Yvette unmuted. Hey, hey, yeah, I'm, 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 oh, I'm, I'm, dry, I'm driving, so I'm kind of co coming in and out and, uh, and I don't want to risk my life for the conversation, but I'm, I'm enjoying listening. Good choice. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, drive safe. Drive safe. If you want to talk to us while you drive, you're welcome. <laughs> Just don't look at your screen. <laughs> okay, I'll try not to. Yeah, this is a very interesting question, um, but I, I wouldn't know how to put it in the, the context or in terms of continuity. But what I was thinking about, can I share? Yes, please. Sure. <laughs> was when, when I read that prayer, um, uh, resurrecting the dead or, or something about the, how, how is it written now? It doesn't say resurrecting. What does it say now? Uh, it renews everything. God renews the whole. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I just think about that in terms of we have our moods are cyclical and we have our ups and downs and we can, we can know that there will be this, the flip side when we're feeling down. How to put that into historical context, I have no idea. Yeah, that's nice. I mean, it's like every time you take a breath, in a way, you're being renewed. 
And I, I like yes. the idea of knowing when you're down, you're going to be up. That's being renewed too. Yeah, that's. So you kind of it speaks to you more in the modern way of Michael Hakol. Yes. Renewal of all rather than resurrecting the dead. Yep. And Ellen, did you want to say something? Oh, you have to unmute. Do you, can you unmute? Let's see if I can send her a message. She's muted. Ellen, you're muted. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Um, can you say again? What was the question again? Um, oh, uh, life. Yeah. When, when you hear something saying God's going to resurrect the dead, does that yeah. speak to you? Or do, would you prefer a more modern version of God just renews all that is? Or how do you see that? Yeah, I, I prefer something more modern. Absolutely. Because, but are other prayers being rewritten? That's, no, I, you know, that's an interesting question. Are the prayers being rewritten? I mean, it's more like phrases within the prayers are sometimes right. Then not the whole prayer just being tossed out, but right. editing. Right. Yeah, so we're working on editing this. Yeah. Yeah, kind of. We're asking people how they feel about that. Would you rather? Yeah, well, when we come back into the big group, we'll kind of see what the sense of this group is to right. it or to reinterpret it or, you know. Yeah, I'm for reinterpreting it. Yeah. Okay. In more modern language, you know? Yes, I, I would agree with you. That's really interesting. There's, I could see like pros and cons to all aspects of these yeah. choices. Yeah. But I thought it was interesting what someone said, I think it was Paul, um, about how we resurrect our ancestors by remembering them, by bringing their practices and traditions into our lives. It doesn't have to be the concept of a physical resurrection or even the resurrection of a soul. We just lift them up and remember them in different ways and we carry them on that way. Yeah. And that was really nice. I think that's beautiful. And, and Bobby, I've been thinking about what you said in our first session about um, when you think about an afterlife, you think about kind of reuniting with your people who have come before. And that's actually extremely biblical. It's like Jacob saying, I'm about to be gathered to my kin. That was a, such an interesting part of the reading, which I did last night. Um, it, it, I'm adding that to the list of things that are part of my tradition, but I didn't know where they came from. Oh. I think I mentioned another time that I never realized that dancing at someone's wedding was like a commandment. I just yeah. thought it was something we did. Yeah. I thought it was like a modern thing. So I'm adding this to the list <laughs> of things I didn't know were Jewish traditions that I didn't know where they came from. Um, I just had a thought that um, cremation is becoming so prevalent amongst Jewish people, but the survivors, you know, have something that the rest of us don't. They have the ashes and many, many people who've had their loved ones cremated keep their ashes in their homes. So they have a tangible form of their yeah. departments. So yeah. That's true, Ellen. And also um, many people sprinkle the ashes of their loved ones in a beautiful place well, that right. is, like the ocean. Right, or, right. Or a mountain. Yeah. It's it had meaning for them, yes. Yes. So that's... So, so there's something to be said for cremation, even though I thought it was forbidden by Jewish law. Is it forbidden? Well, well I would not say it's exactly forbidden, but it's certainly not a Jewish practice or custom or endorsed I, by the tradition. Right. Yeah. But you can find Jewish ways to make it, you know meaningful today like you can couch your desire to do that in jewish teachings such as like you know you could do it in terms of being connected to your ancestors which is a very jewish practice and having them at home with the ashes at home with you like you said ellen like that would be a way of thinking about it in a jewish way even though historically it has not been a jewish practice okay. That's an example of reconstructing an ancient practice. That's what we're talking about here, right? Like right. to 
All right, I think it's time to close the rooms out and people will have a minute. Okay. Okay. Oh, I can see who was in which room here. Interesting. These look like yeah. good breakout rooms. Yeah. Oh, wow. Interesting. Did you choose who was in which room or just nope. ran random? They look like great rooms to me. Nicely divided. Yep. And they're coming back. Oh, but I actually don't see everybody on my list here. Oh, here we go. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Okay, people are coming back into the main room here. I think there's a couple more groups coming in. Here we go. Okay, welcome back to the main room, everybody. We're gonna do a little poll here. I'm gonna ask how many groups or how many people wanted to keep the traditional language, but maybe interpret it in a new way, but actually keep the Hebrew that says resurrection of the dead. So if you were in that camp, put your yad up, your hand, and hold it up so we can really see here. Because I'm gonna, if you hold it up, I'm gonna, it's actually, it's so hard to get a count because the Zoom rooms make you jump around. But one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, no, eight, nine. Yeah. Bobby, are you counting? I, yeah, I count about 12. It is hard to get it exactly. Yeah, it's hard to get it exactly because the screens jump around, but it's like, 10, 12, something like that. Really interesting. How many people would rather edit the prayer and come up with a substitute modern term such as God renews life? I'm going to count here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, let's see. Wow, it's really actually about half and half in our. Interesting. Okay. So I want to hear a report back from each group, but I want to first say both of those choices that I just gave are reconstructionist choices, which means you could either keep the traditional Hebrew, but have a new way of thinking about it. Like that resurrect the dead doesn't actually mean putting the bones together or having the, you know, the soul go to a particular place or be rewarded as an individual. You could think about it in a new way. Or another way of reconstructing the tradition would be to edit it and change the words, which reconstructing Jews have done in, in a number of our prayers. You guys are very familiar with our long kiddish that none of us can ever remember that line that we changed, which is that instead of saying God chose us from all people, we say God brought us close to God's service. And we make that same change in the Aaliyah prayer. We edit out the old one we don't like, which is about God choosing the Jews from amongst all people. And we put in an alternative Jewish sentence that's elsewhere in our tradition, but we put it there in those two prayers, which says um, that God brings us close to God's work. Uh, Jewish renewal people make a slight edit in that Aaliyah prayer. It's really, uh, this is the one I actually prefer, which is to change Asher bachar banu mikol ha'amim, God chose us from all other people, to asher bachar banu im kol ha'amim, God told us, chose us with all other peoples. Change one letter, the m, which takes it away from from all other people, into im, which means with all other people, and you completely change the meaning of the thing. So these are ways of reconstructing a tradition so that you're, you have continuity, but you also have change. You may have change of meaning or you may have the actual change in the words you're saying along with the change in meaning. So let's hear somebody report back from each of the groups and let's just hear a summary of 
any insights you came up with in your group. And I see Debbie is going to speak. Debbie, do you happen to know which group you're reporting back in for? It's hard to remember. six. Okay. And Joe and Mar Marilyn and Maria were with me. Joe very strongly believed that there is an afterlife. And I saw he raised his hand to keep the language the way it is. Um, we all found it a difficult task, by the way. Um, we're all, um, and for me, you live on through the memories of those that you've touched. But um, we came up with this possible wording. Um, God, thank you for this home for our soul, you know, the human body as a home for our soul. And when we leave that home, thank you for the blessing of freedom from pain and peace of mind. And Joe wanted to add, in the afterlife. <laughs> so I don't think we had agreement on that, but. Uh... Wow. So you're, also, you're proposing creating a whole new prayer to add in, which is also a reconstructionist option, but you're doing it in line with some themes from our tradition. Oh, well, that's good because I didn't know before. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's hear from another group. Ed. Thank you, Rabbi. Uh, I was in the group with uh, Enid and Evie and Paul and Phil, and uh, I, I think there was mostly discomfort with the traditional wording, uh, except I preferred it, and, and we're kind of all struggling with uh, the concept of resurrection of the dead. Um, generally, I, I, I like traditional wording, and, and I, I, I also struggle because the Hebrew words, metin, to me, if I read it literally without any background understanding or rabbinic instruction as to how I should understand the words. Um, they don't mean resurrection to me. They just mean to enliven the dead when I read it literally. And I, you know, um, I don't have a problem with that kind of plea. If you are uh, abundantly merciful, please enliven the dead. It's kind of a nice plea and meaningful. So that's Good. In my group's take. Thank you. Let's hear from Diane. Uh, I was with Beverly, and um, I think that we were very reluctant to try to change and adopt new language. And so, with the word "resurrect the dead," we had struggled, like others, about that. What does it mean? And we rejected very quickly the idea of it being part of the old traditions and concepts of the Mashiach and, and waiting and uh, some kingdom to come and all, but rather we both agreed, found out that we both really do believe that there, the, the soul lives on after death. This is something we agreed on. And so in that sense, that sense of, uh, of the resurrection would be the soul that lives on and in some ways, does return to the to this earth and that does exist in, in, uh, going forward. Um, so we looked at the concept of the resurrection being souls being returned to the earth in cycles and in that way paying respect to the past uh, and us being responsible, perhaps it's a reconstructionist idea of, of us also being if we're part of God and God is us, then we have a responsibility to keep on the, the best of what uh, comes back into this earth to, to bring back and elevate uh, and evolve uh, as specifically as humans. So I hope that's clear. Mm, thank you. Pat Wish. Well, we got caught <clears throat> Well, and caught in the best sense of the word, in uh, discussing the uh, the idea of cremation without, we forgot to talk about the language. <laughs> but one <laughs> of the things that came out, which I was asked to report as part of my report to you, is that if we're lucky, we get visits from the people who have gone. Mm -hmm. that, that in a dream or somehow, and, and that it's a lucky thing to happen and a gift from somewhere. That's it. Okay. 
Uh, we should have, I think, three more groups. That was number seven, by the way. That was number seven. Okay, who else? Myrna, you can unmute, Myrna. Our group, uh, we really weren't too keen on the idea of resurrection. That, that uh, you know, if you suddenly find yourself on earth in a different body or, or your, even in your own body and the people, the life that you knew is, is not the life you're a part of, it would be very confusing. Um, and, you know, we try to figure, you know, if you were resurrected, what would, where would you be? What would you, what would, how would it be good? And, and so we kind of didn't like the idea. And that's what I have to report. Thank you, Myrna. And do we have a couple others? Maybe there was only one other group. Iris Newman, you can unmute. There you go. We, we discussed the concept of resurrection and my belief in it was something that happens way far away. And when we get to uh, the actual meaning, we get into problems like if you have two husbands, are they both resurrected with you? If one has a former wife, do they get rest and so forth? And it gets fairly complicated. So my my cons my thing is that it's way off in the distance. Okay, Iris, thank you. And was there one more group? Carol, do you want to re report from our group? Carol? Uh, you're on mute, Carol. You need to unmute. If you if you want to be the reporter, you need to unmute. I didn't want to, but I will. We were in great disagreement. We came from d three different traditions. Oh. And uh, basically, my best summary would be that each person needs to decide their comfort level with tradition while respecting the differing views of others. And that's the best summary that we can get from our group. Okay, when do you want to add anything to that? Or that's good. Okay. Oh, I think that's great. Well, I would like to say you guys are amazing reconstructing Jews. That was like a really wide range of possibility there. Um, now, of course, in the reconstructing Judaism community, we do it communally. So like if we were deciding on a practice for our congregation, what prayers we're going to use, it's a communal discussion and basically a democratic process of deciding. That's our process. If we were conservative Jews, the rabbis would vote. If we were Orthodox Jews, we would ask like the head rabbi and they would decide. So each denomination has its own process for deciding these things. At some point in our reconstructing Judaism movement, people sat in a democratic place and made decisions and created our Kol Hanishama prayer book series, which we now use. And within our community, we make decisions collectively through our ritual committee and our steering committee, our council, our steering council, um, about what our practices will be in this community. But you all are amazing reconstructing Jews. It's just that in our movement, it's not an individual thing. It's a collective democratic process uh, for our community. But I want to say one last thing before we wrap up for today, which is that an amazing thing about a civilizational approach is that each civilization becomes a resource to the ones that are yet to come. And so today, when we go back and draw from the different civilizations to come up with our Jewish decisions today, there's a huge well of resource there. And one of the places we can go back to on this question of the Olam Haba, the world to come, is to say, well, you know, maybe there isn't an individual 
world to come for like me because I did good deeds on this earth and I'm going to have some particular reward. But maybe the world to come has to do with collectively sustaining the Jewish people. Like we go back to a time when there wasn't really the concept of an individual. There was the concept of a communal destiny. And we now can circle back to that and say, oh, maybe one of the ways that we have eternity or olam haba, us, each of us, is by sustaining the Jewish community. It's the people that live on. It's the Judaism that lives on. It's not necessarily me that's going to be resurrected, but what's going to be you know, in that olam haba is that beyond my death, this will live on, this thing called Judaism. And that's actually a much earlier idea. It's not a, necessarily just a modern idea that we can circle back to. It's sort of like in the growth of an individual who goes through each developmental stage, you know, the resilience and the kind of inner strength that you develop as a toddler becomes useful to you as a resource when you're an elementary school kid, when you're a teenager, like your health builds and you can take it all with you as you go to the next uh, collective stage. I mean, the next developmental stage. So it's all there for you as a resource. Everything you ever learned is there as a resource for what you need to face next. And that's true in Judaism too. That we get to draw on every stage we've ever been through, every civilization that ever gave us insight or value. And as we move forward in, in creating this, this civilization of Judaism for its future, we get to take everything helpful from that and invent the future of our tradition. So I hope this has been um, a helpful session on continuity and change, Judaism as an evolving civilization with a pretty concrete example of dealing with this olam haba, um, world to come, uh, con you know, sort of a specific concept. Our final session, the third in this series is gonna be really fun. We're gonna do a fun activity together. I hope everybody will be here. And in the meantime, I hope people have a really nice Thanksgiving, whatever way works for you and that we um, will close together with our prayer for learning together. And I'll keep the chat box just open for a few minutes. Oh, I think um, Bobby and Diane each have something to say, I think, and then we'll do our closing prayer. No, not Diane, Bobby. Bobby. Okay. Um, yeah, I just had a, a brief announcement. So on Friday night, December 3, we are having our um, Kabbalat Shabbat service, but it's also gonna be our Hanukkah celebration. And it's also going to be the first time we're having a worship service together in person uh, since the pandemic started. Mm -hmm. However, it is also going to be on Zoom. So without getting into all the nitty gritty details, please check your this week email that will come out tomorrow, which will have the link to register. It is very important that if you are coming in person, that you register for it. Okay, and the link will be there and it's very easy to register once you have that link. If you have any problems, email us, call us, whatever. And um, the other thing is that for uh, it, since you all received the link to today's program, you will again receive the link for our December 12, December 12 our third session of Rabbi Julie's series. So um, again, any questions? People know how to reach us and um, we'll go from there. And I want to thank you all for attending. And I really want to thank Rabbi Julie for a, such an interesting program. It's a great, great series. Um, let me just also add to what Bobby just said. If you're at home for the Hanukkah service, please try to have a Hanukkah there that you can light in your own little home sanctuary. And if you're coming in person, please bring your Hanukkah with candles and we will be lighting them. We'll just have a mass lighting in presence and in cyberspace and lots of light to bring into the world. So you're part. And we're going to hope not to burn down the Kennedy house. <laughs> <laughs> We're pretty sure we can do this. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay. We're going to sing our Kaddish de Rabbanon song just in appreciation for learning together. Much appreciation from me for all the sharing that's happened today. Really, really interesting. 
for our teachers and our students and the students of our students. We ask for peace and loving kindness and let us say amen. We ask for peace and loving kindness and let us say amen. We ask for peace and loving kindness and let us say amen. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Love to all people. Good to see everybody. And Thank you so much. Have a good I'll one. Leave, I'll leave Zoom open for a few minutes. Thank you, Julie. Thank we'll you. Thanks, work. Rabbi. Jerry, Jerry. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Rabbi. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. See you Wednesday. Okay. Oh, Bye. Bye. I want to thank you both for bringing up memory again. <laughs> yes, I, I thought that was so good. And I am also thankful for being having so much food for thought from this group. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye, all. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Bye. 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 We'll see. Thank you. Thanks, Bobby. My pleasure. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and, and close this out now, unless somebody else wants to speak. Okay, and I'll just let, uh, I see Rochelle is still here. Rochelle, just to let you know, I'm going to add you to our email list, so you'll get all of our updated program information. Okay, everybody have a good afternoon and a wonderful Thanksgiving. See you all later.